Thank you so much, John, and uh, colleagues at the Data Futures Institute. Congratulations on the launch. Thank you for letting me be a very a small part of it. I'm uh, absolutely delighted to drop in. And uh, John's introduction reminded me how 44 years ago, as I was writing my undergraduate uh, thesis, uh, carrying the big boxes of punch cards under my arm, uh, taking them over to the counter at the computer center, watching them fed through the card reader, and then waiting, waiting expectantly as uh, uh, the cards would be read and then the, uh, uh, the, the uh, large uh, paper uh, trail would be put back in the cubby hole for us to see whether we had uh, miscoded something and had to do it all again uh, throughout the day. So uh, that was 44 years ago. And since then, we have had uh, Moore's Law operating uh, basically every 18 months. Uh, and uh, we have had uh, uh, billion fold improvements of our capacity to compute, uh, to transmit, to store data. Uh, and along with that uh, has come through uh, Moore's Law, the ability to take an idea of uh, Mr. Hinton from the 1970s and 80s that seemed unworkable once upon a time, a neural network, uh, and uh, actually through back propagation to create very sophisticated, unbelievably uh, sophisticated uh, 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 artificial intelligence systems that are uh, transforming how we understand everything, uh, how we understand what information is and how we understand what our brains are and how they work and how neural networks uh, work. Uh, it is an astounding uh, uh, thing to live through. It is our great revolution, in fact. Uh, and I'm a, a, a huge uh, fan and devotee of your field. Uh, I have hung around uh, DeepMind uh, over uh, recent years and uh, found uh, among all of the many, many breakthroughs of artificial intelligence, uh, perhaps most emotionally amazing to me, uh, how AlphaGo Zero uh, went and sat in a corner for a few hours and taught itself chess at the level of uh, superhuman uh, grandmaster level. Uh, and in a few hours of self play from tabula rasa, from no expert inputs other than the rules itself, uh, became the greatest uh, chess master of history uh, and discovered in a few hours every great opening and its variations that had been learned over hundreds and hundreds of years of, of advanced human play. Oh my God, who could have known uh, that uh, putting numerical weights on a deep neural network could translate into chess at uh, superhuman skill? I don't think we knew. Or who could have known that to crack the code of machine translation would not be the efforts of linguists uh, and language specialists, but uh, a team that was able to do translation from Chinese to uh, English without knowing any Chinese at all, uh, other than having texts that could be read in to a deep uh, learning system uh, and Google showed that from pure numerical correlations of how uh, symbol, uh, how uh, um, Chinese characters uh, appear without any semantic knowledge, uh, any grammatical knowledge, uh, you can have a highly, highly functional uh, translation system. So we're learning a lot about the nature of knowledge itself. And because of uh, Moore's law, uh, because of being able to have very deep learning, uh, hundreds and hundreds of layers uh, in uh, advanced uh, neural networks, uh, in convolutional networks, uh, what can be done now is astounding. So I don't think we know uh, the answer to the basic question of uh, where the limit really will be uh, of what AI can mean for sustainable development. But uh, you know, uh, and I uh, see it on your wonderful website of the projects of the Data Futures Institute, and I made my own quick list of some of the areas 
where artificial intelligence systems will make a huge difference. And if you just uh, let me summarize my own list very, very briefly, I start with smart infrastructure. We need to move to a zero carbon energy system, to an energy efficient system, to intraday marketing of energy to uh, flatten the curve of electricity use. I'm not talking about flattening the curve of the virus. I'm talking about uh, lowering uh, peak uh, energy demands for energy uh, efficiency. Uh, and so smart power grids, uh, of course, uh, smart uh, internet uh, networking, uh, efficient appliances and smart appliances, and being able to monitor complex infrastructure from afar. We don't need Homer Simpson sitting at the, uh, uh, at the uh, terminal of the nuclear plant <laughs> for our safety. We can monitor our infrastructure from a distance through uh, smart systems that are constantly doing uh, their own diagnostics of our uh, core infrastructure. That's number one. Number two, I believe smart mobility will play a huge difference. I'm a fan of uh, autonomous vehicles. They're already working on mine sites. They're working in agriculture for precision agriculture. And I'm sure that they're gonna be working in the gridded streets of New York sometime in the future for e-commerce, for uh, deliveries of uh, goods and services. And they will be safer in my view. Uh, so we will figure out how to make smart self-driving vehicles work for human benefit. And this obviously is an area completely dependent on uh, artificial intelligence systems. A third area that is vital will be smart services. Uh, E-diagnostics already taking place. We have better imaging from machines than we do from expert radiologists who have been looking at uh, MRIs and other imaging for decades but they're outperformed now by smart systems, for example, on macular degeneration, an area that DeepMind worked on. And uh, we know that uh, many parts of the world have no radiologists around, but who needs them if your phone can do it, uh, if your uh, computer can do it, or if you can do it uh, at least remotely. Uh, E-health in general, uh, with the already Watson from IBM, uh, turned into a great repository of uh, rapid search through clinical cases, through diagnostics, and through a uh, kind of uh, highly sophisticated Bayesian processing for making differential diagnostics. I think that this will play a huge role. I'm quite convinced that uh, e-learning will work with the individualized uh, student learning uh, as well as uh, the online education that is part of our COVID world, but I think will be part of our lifelong world in the future. Uh, a fourth area that I've already mentioned that I think could be as influential and important for human well being as any other is natural language real time processing. I think the Bible had it approximately right when uh, it interpreted the Tower of Babel, uh, the Babel of uh, thousands of languages as being the great obstacle of humanity to cooperation. Uh, so much of our hatred, so much of our war, so much of our enmity, so much of our lack of cooperation has been about linguistic divisions. Uh, when the Greeks called their foes barbarians, what they basically meant was they don't speak Greek. Uh, and now we should all have uh, our little uh, plugs in our ears that are giving us simultaneous real-time interpretation from any major language to any other major language uh, as a way to have normal interactions uh, across uh, uh, linguists or across the speakers of uh, different natural languages, I think this could be the road to peace. Oh, that's what you meant. Uh, as long as the systems don't mistranslate uh, and uh, get it right, I think natural language processing is extraordinarily important for a cooperative world. So if uh, the Data Futures Institute can come up with that, uh, please do so. 
Uh, a fifth area that I think is extremely important is remote sensing. Uh, of course, we have low Earth orbital satellites uh, taking uh, pictures of uh, the planet twice a day uh, on all parts of the planet. Uh, this enables us to watch where forest fires are raging, uh, where uh, uh, pollution plumes and air quality are threatening human health, uh, where other weather anomalies, uh, heat waves or uh, droughts uh, and other conditions are occurring, where deforestation is taking place, uh, where forest fires uh, are blazing, where illegal fisheries, uh, fishing is operating. Uh, we were just on a call with the Pacific Island countries complaining about all the illegal fishing in their waters. The satellites can watch where those ships are and who's doing it. And with uh, AI systems, we could bring under control a lot of this uh, illegal fishing activity. And then finally, all in this line, if we can aggregate big data and aggregate remote sensing data and use smart systems, we can get real-time SDG indicators. We've set up at SDSN recently a portal called SDGs Today, which aims to curate real-time data on the sustainable development goals, whether it's rates of deforestation uh, or fisheries or crop failures or extreme weather events uh, and so on. We know using uh, uh, sophisticated uh, machine learning systems, we can turn satellite readings of the night lights and perhaps the uh, rooftops, uh, whether they're uh, thatched roofs or metal roofs, into uh, uh, proven models of poverty, for example. So we should be able to have real-time indicators of poverty in the world, not by expensive and uh, 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 household surveys, but by satellite observation that are also ground tested and ground truth uh, with the machine learning algorithms. So I would like to see us develop real-time SDG data. Why real-time? So that we can use it for holding our governments to account, so that we can use it for SDG management practices, uh, so that we can uh, use it for uh, emergency humanitarian response activities. All of these require information and artificial intelligence is our powerful tool for bringing together big data, remote sensing, uh, and all of the massive terabytes of flows of data uh, in the world in a sensible way. So just uh, some thoughts that come to mind, but I'm a huge fan and uh, very excited to be part of uh, the launch today and uh, am eager to hear, uh, especially from John after the launch, some of the areas of activity uh, and hope that SDSN can give you some support in this great new mission.